Q&A time, let's get started. Where do you get your clothes? I'm short and can hardly shop anywhere. All right, I feel your pain. Basically, you're a jack guy, and when you buy clothes, it's droopy around the arms, droopy around the waist. Basically, you're like a little kid trying to wear your father's clothing, right? I understand it. It's not that you lack muscle mass, it's that the shirt is not calibrated for your frame. Because typically speaking, these larger shirt sizes are designed for average people, but for heavier weights. So a guy who wears an XL is not usually going to be a bodybuilder. In most cases, it's going to be a guy who's fat. And on top of that, the larger shirt sizes tend to be used by taller men. All right. So if you're short and you have huge muscles and you're trying to wear XL, yes, it's going to be tight around your chest and back. But because you have a small frame, because you're a short guy, it's not going to fit properly. It just won't. So what you need to do is go down a shirt size and don't feel bad. Leave your ego out the door. It's just a freaking shirt size, just a little a letter L or M or whatever. It doesn't matter. You want to wear clothes that look good on you. And if you try getting two big sizes, you're going to look terrible when you wear shirts. So if you have the muscular size to pull off an XL, but you find that the shirts are droopy around the sleeves because they're too long and it's baggy around the waist because you got a small waist and you're a lean guy, just go with a large. Go with a large. It's going to be more tight, okay? Especially around the trap area and upper back, but you're not going to have that bagginess around your waist. And these sleeves are going to be a little bit higher. That's what I would do personally, okay? And make sure when you buy your clothes that you find brands that work for you. Okay, and you can have to do a little bit of experimentation. You're gonna have to go to different malls, different stores, and see what works best. For me, I go to the local mall because most things are on style and it tends to fit me pretty well. But I do have to go a shirt size lower, otherwise, it's too baggy around the waist and arms. Now, as a last resort, you can always consider uh, tailoring. Tailoring definitely works, they, they could tailor your sleeves, your waist area, and now you'll be able to wear uh, larger clothing sizes without any uh, complications. So, that's my advice. Next question you seem to be having trouble staying tight during the bench. Are there any exercise to help fix this? Yeah, what I would do is the reverse band row. Basically, you go in a power rack, you set up some bands to the top, and what you do is you just row. When you have an empty bar, the weight is going to be floating in the air. So all you got to do now is row, and you will be building sport-specific tightness for the bench press. This is a pretty good movement, and it will teach you how to stay tight. So do a couple of those, you know, maybe even do some, uh, some standard rows before benching. And I think you're going to be a lot more tight. So that's a really good drill to hammer in that technique. Reverse band rows. Hey, Alex, I'm building my forearms. The portion near the elbows is getting huge, but the half portion near the wrist is extremely small. How do I train that? Okay, two things. Number one, you have to factor in the attachment point, okay? Some guys like myself are really blessed in the forearm department, okay? And it really, like the forearm attaches directly to the freaking wrist, even the medius part. So it's going to look bigger than a guy who has really thin wrists and the forms like attach a bit higher, okay? So you have to consider that, but in most cases, the reason why people have problems building the forms is because they lack flexors. Everybody's talking about hammer curls and reverse curls, right? That's great, and it's gonna build your brachial radialis, okay, right over here, but it's not enough for the flexors. If you wanna build your wrist and forearm flexors, you need to do wrist flexion exercises. That's why arm wrestlers have the biggest forms period. Most arm wrestlers have bigger forms than your average bodybuilder. That's just fact. Um, if you look at some of these competitions, these guys have some serious numbers. Over 17 very easily, okay? This is extreme, and the reason is because they're doing a lot of wrist flexion. So that's what you have to start doing. Stop focusing so much on those hammer curls and reverse curls. Instead, flex that wrist, you know? And I think that when you start getting strong at that, specifically arm wrestling movements, you're going to get a lot thicker because the flexors is really where that meat comes from. The meat that attaches really low to the wrist, that's the flexors. Okay, up here, brachial radialis. A lot of guys have that, but few people have the flexors. I'm a rugby player and require a lot of neck strength aside from neck curls and neck extensions and bridges. Would you recommend anything else for sports-specific performance? Yes. As a rugby player, or even a football player, there's going to be a lot of rotational forces that you have to account for. So what I would do personally is get a neck harness and attach it to your loops so that you can do twisting motions. You can do twisting motions over here, all right? Also great for combat athletes who are getting hit in the face, right? So twisting, you can do bending with the head this way, and you can even do rotations, which is great. You can do dynamic rotations. So you can take the band and you can do like little motions like this, 
you know? And you can do like tackling drills as well. You can take the band, put it behind you and you run a little bit, you know, while the band pulls you back. There's all kinds of little things you could do. Now, in terms of the training itself, I would recommend that you keep the volume uh, specific to the intervals of the sport. So if you're going to be playing for 60 seconds at a time before it stops, well, you want to make sure that you're training your neck for 60 seconds. For example, a lot of fighters are going to be in a round for three minutes, right? So they're going to do neck work nonstop for three minutes. Just a little piece of advice. How can I get stronger at arm wrestling if I don't have weights? Do you recommend any other grip strength equipment that I can buy besides barbells and dumbbells? For sure, bro. Okay, first of all, you don't actually have to lift weights to be a good arm wrestler, okay? Um, it's certainly recommended, and that's what the best guys do. But you can still be really, really, really good and compete at a high level with just body weight training. If you master pull-up variations, especially the finger pull-ups, um, you're going to be a great arm wrestler, okay? I have a friend who only does calisthenics and tricking. He's like 138 pounds. He does not lift weights. But I have a very, very, very hard time beating him at arm wrestling. Why? He's very good at these grip movements. And he also has a lot of arm wrestling experience. That's the second thing, right? If you want to be a good arm wrestler, you actually have to arm wrestle. It's sport specific. If you don't arm wrestle, I don't care how many drills you do, you're not going to be the best. You have to arm wrestle. That's why a guy like me, I'm hard to take down, man. I started arm wrestling when I was in elementary school, okay? So I've been doing this for over 10 years and have a lot of experience. So the more match experience you have, the more you can, like, you actually, you're sparring a guy one-on-one, -on -one, the better you're going to be. You're going to refine your technique. You're going to get stronger in the positions that you need. And that's just the best way to do it. But yeah, that's what I would do. A lot of sparring. And in addition, you're going to want to uh, master the calisthenics, right? Some good devices that you can get are things like the eagle loops. You can do your finger pull-ups like that, which is going to help you tremendously. You can get gymnastic rings to really focus on uh, your advanced pulls. I mean, you don't have to lift weights. Just do advanced calisthenics with volume and intensity, and you're going to be good. Find some devices that you can include to, say, uh, pull-up bars at the park and improve upon that, you know? Another good exercise for arm wrestling is uh, you take a, a towel, loop it on top of a pull-up bar, and you can do towel pull-ups. Excellent for arm wrestling. Really, really, really good. So it's all about being creative. You don't have to do weights, but if you want to be the best, you got to spar, and you got to find creative ways of hitting your grip, okay? And try to get exercise that involve uh, wrist flexion as well. That's going to be uh, quite beneficial. What do you think about progressing in the 15 to 20 rep range for muscle? I'm a big fan of doing this. I've used this a lot in my volume days with tremendous success. So I like reps of 15. I often do three sets of 15, four sets of 15, you know, reps of 20. I'm a big fan of three by 20, five by 20. I think both of these things work very well. So don't knock it until you try it. Give it a shot. And I think you'll be amazed at the gains. Alex, why do I feel energized after intensity day instead of getting drained? Well, that's because you're stimulating your central nervous system. When you do a really serious PR, you're like hyped up, you know? I know for me that if I get a serious PR, I can't sleep after. I'm just too hyped up. I'm too energized. It's like I'm not sleeping. Another thing, too, is that guys who do intensity work, a lot of them are abusing the caffeine. So they got a lot of stimulants in their body. So I feel that a lot of guys are taking a, like tremendous amounts of caffeine. They're taking caffeine and pre-workouts. And what happens is that they're so hyped up. And then you combine that with the CNS being prime. And it's like they can't sleep after, so they feel energized. I get that. On top of that, intensity work, you don't get fatigued in the muscle necessarily. You don't get burning sensations. You just get, it's just strain. You're just straining for a few seconds and that's it. So it's not going to have the same effect as volume work. Volume work, you're sweating like crazy. You're pumped like crazy. And you're drained. You're literally, you're sapping away every bit of life force that you have. That's what volume days do. Intensity it's easier, but it's harder during the set itself. The set itself, you have to freaking grind and stress, but it's not the same effect on your fatigue levels, at least for a lot of guys. So I think that you're probably relying too much on the stimulants and um, you're hyping up like crazy. So you're like, you can't fall asleep. You're hitting all these goddamn PRs. So it is what it is. I want to invest in bands. Which would you recommend? I recommend 41 inches in length and you should probably get Mini bands, monster mini bands, and light bands. And if you're on the weaker side, get some micro mini bands as well. In terms of where to buy them, Elite FTS, Rogue Fitness, Westside Barbell. Those are my top three recommendations. But technically, you can get them anywhere. Just make sure that they're 41 inches when they're not stretched. 
and um, make sure that you have the right thicknesses, okay? And to do that, you can refer to the Elite FTS website. Look at the thickness indicated for mini band, monster mini, and light, and copy that when buying bands off Amazon, right? What do you think of using reverse bands to up your conventional deadlift, hack deadlift, Jefferson deadlifts, and Z presses? Yeah, I'm not really um, a huge fan of reverse band, okay? I don't find that it has the best carryover. It's great for deloading at the bottom and overloading the top. It's great if you have injuries, especially for something like a deadlift where the bottom, which is where most of the back strains occur, you can deload that a little bit and at the top it gets a bit heavier. So I can see that application, same thing for benching. It's easier on the shoulders. But in terms of specific carryover to the raw lifts, not my number one choice. If you're going to do reverse band, make sure that you set it up correctly. I find too many guys, they're hooking it up in such a way that the reverse band is taking off tremendous amounts of tension. All right? A better way is to set it up with the pins and the power rack. This way you have a little bit of assistance like you're having a spotter. Right? So that's one thing you could do. And also make sure that you're using uh, lighter tensions. Micro mini bands, mini bands, and monster. And, and light at the absolute max. But if you start going in crazy tensions, dude, you're getting like a lot of poundages out of those reverse bands, right? Which is, it's fine for general strength, but for carryover, it's not the best, right? So for me, I never found reverse band to be that beneficial. It, it just, it never worked for me that well. What I found worked best was chains and bands. Those work really well. Chains work exceptionally well, 100% of the time for me. And then the bands work really well too. Specifically, Double mini bands and double uh, monster bands, right? And also uh, short bands for poles work very well. I found that the, the light short, average short, and strong short work really well for that. And in terms of double bands, minis and monsters are great. You might be confused if you're not a user of bands, but uh, if you are, then you understand what I just said. But yeah, I'm not a fan of reverse. I prefer doubled and... The standard way of doing it, you know? I like pullovers, but they don't feel right on my shoulders. Any good alternatives? Yeah, what I would encourage you to do is the cable pullover, okay? This shouldn't stress your shoulders. Because of the angles and the way that the weight's coming about, it should feel quite nice, right? So go to the cable station, try the cable pullover. I think you'll feel a lot better on the shoulders. It'll build thoracic extension, and it's not going to have that same stress as if you're lying down and you're pulling hard behind the back. So... Try that out. I get dizzy and lightheaded every time I use the Valsalva maneuver on heavy compounds. Why is this happening? Well, you're probably breathing into your chest, okay? So the pressure is building up like crazy, and then you start seeing stars and shit. The, the air is too high up. You want to bring it lower into your stomach area. Like, bring the, bring the breath low. You shouldn't feel like passing out or any of that stuff, okay? Like, even when I do my one-rep maxes, sometimes I can see stars. But usually that's if I'm like straining really, really hard. If it's a long freaking rep, you know, and maximum intensity. And even if I have caffeine in my system or I'm, and, and I'm hyped. But in regular circumstances, you shouldn't be feeling like that. If you're just doing a reps of five or whatever, it shouldn't be an issue. Another thing too is that you might be holding the Valsalva for too long. So if you're doing a set of 10 on your squats, maybe you're holding your breath for every single repetition. Like you're not stop. You just go, go, go tight. That might be a problem. What I would do is reset the breath after every rep. So after one rep of the squat, you come back up, right? You can breathe. And then go again, reset. So I think you got to time your breathing a little bit better and bring it down to the lower area. Don't bring it so high up because then you're going to start feeling those sensations, okay? Every time I do a conventional deadlift, I hit my shins with the barbell. How come? Well, in my opinion, this is normal because you want to be pulling the bar back, not just straight up. Right? When you pull straight up, the bar tends to go in front of you and your leverages are not as optimal. So if you're if it's scraping against your shins as you're pulling, to me, that's a good sign. That's just my opinion. Another perspective might be that you're bending the legs too much, right? So your hips are too low. And when you start pulling, that's what creates that effect, you know? So maybe what you have to do is when you grab the bar, when you bend your shins, don't be pushing the bar forward. Don't be rolling the bar forward with your shins. You understand? You want to... Bend it so that your shins touch the bar, but they don't go past that point. Then when you start pulling, it's going to be in better alignment. So it's possible that you're bending those shins too far forward, you know? But other than that, I don't consider shin scraping to be a bad thing. That's just what I believe, personally. Will doing rows help with my internal rotation of the shoulders? Uh, it should, yeah. Because a lot of guys, they're bench monkeys, and they have very, very weak rows. And the result is that they develop all kinds of kyphotic posture. And the way to fix that is by doing the opposite. If you're going to do a horizontal push, 
where you want to do a horizontal pull. And rows tend to correct that. Rows, in addition to rear delt work and stretching exercises, right? Specifically, thoracic extension movements. So yeah, if you have internally rotated shoulders, you look like a freaking gorilla, start doing some more rows, hit those rear delts, make sure to externally rotate, do a lot of external rotation movements, do some mobility work at home, maybe some scapula wall slides, and uh, you're going to see that the problem is going to go away. So yeah, definitely do some rows. What do you think of strict curling competition style for big arms and forearms? For biceps, I think it might be one of the best movements you could do. I hear a lot of guys saying that the weighted chin up is the best bicep movement, but I strongly disagree. For me personally, my biceps are my worst body part, literally my worst. And I've done 145 pounds dead hang strict, like with a freaking pause, right? Full range, head over the bar, weighted chin, didn't do much, right? When I do chins, I feel it in my lats. I feel it in my back primarily, even my forearms. So I don't consider chins to be the best because you're taking a huge part of the back into the equation and there's a relative strength component. Whereas with the strict curl, it's biceps, man. It's really a bicep movement. You can know exactly where you lie. I think the strict curl is, is the ultimate test of strict bicep strength. Back against the wall, you know, no problem, strict. You're testing your bicep strength at that point. Now, in terms of forearms, not my favorite movement. No. I would much rather you train like an arm wrestler or a competitive grip sport. Do a lot of wrist flexion movements. Um, do different hammer curls, different reverse curls. Um, you want to train in a more specific way, right? So look at my forearm playlist. I talk about these things, but I wouldn't really consider it the best uh, forearm builder, mainly just uh, biceps. What do you think about bench partials, lockout only with heavier weights, for example? Depends how you're doing the partials. If you're doing manual half reps, I'm not a fan of it. I think you can develop uh, elbow pain, uh, false movement patterns, and it's not going to carry over, right? So when we talk about bench partials, I believe it must be done off pins or using boards, right? So if you're going to do quarter reps, have pins there, okay? Have pins and have boards. Boards would be better because it's going to put less stress on the joints. You know, when you put steel on steel in the rack, it could cause some irritation. But board press, let's say uh, a 3-4 board press is going to be much better for you compared to do just doing half reps for the triceps, you know? And when you touch the boards, if you want to keep more tension on the triceps in a sense, well, you could just do light touching, you know? doesn't have to be anything crazy. What is your opinion on hand grippers to get stronger forms? Based off my experience, they don't have carryover to uh, lifts of any type. And it doesn't really do much for forearm mass. I'm just saying off my experience. I have the heavy duty grippers. I worked up to 300 pounds. The 300, the heavy duty 300 didn't do much. I find that pinch work, hub work, finger work, uh, thick bar work, rolling handle work, much better for the grip. But when you start doing all these grippers and stuff, I just don't find it carries over to most movements. So I'm just sharing my experiences. It's great. It's great for crushing strength. You're going to get better at the grippers. But that's about it, in my opinion. You might get some more mass in the forearm area, like right near the elbow. Let's say the lowest you could pull from due to back injury is right below the knee in a rack. And thus, you choose a Jefferson rack pull as your main pull. How would you go about periodizing in order to raise this main lift? Okay, so you got a back injury, and the only lift that does not cause you discomfort is a Jefferson rack pull below the knee, right? Okay, a good movement that you could rotate is the block pull done at the same height. So if you're doing a below the knee Jefferson rack, it might be six inches off the floor, okay? So what you want to do is pull off six inch blocks as a secondary movement or as a part of your rotation. That's a movement you could do right there. Another thing you could experiment with is band tension. Do double bands in the power rack. You can double some mini bands, monster mini bands, light bands, average bands, even strong. So you have a lot of different tensions to choose from, and that's going to change the way the exercise feels, right? And then another thing too is like, you can experiment with DUP type setups. It doesn't have to be the classic and current by which you rotate movements while maintaining volume and intensity. You could treat it a bit differently. You could have days where you're doing like, 65, 75%. Some days you're at 40, 50%. Other days you're at freaking 90%. So maybe training in a more DUP type fashion will be better for you if you're limited in exercise selection, right? And then the uh, final recommendation is perhaps you alternate between touch and go and dead stop. Although I'm not a fan of touch and go, uh, it will change things up a little bit. So those are just some little ideas at the top of my head. I say get creative and see what you could do. So yeah, next question. Will neck extensions worsen my forward head posture? I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. What I would say is that 
Your posture might get worse if you're not training your neck in a balanced way. So if you're only doing neck extensions, maybe you're going to have issues. So perhaps doing neck extensions and neck curls is going to fix the issue. What I can say about neck curls is that it brings your posture in. A lot of guys have forward head posture. Well, neck curls brings you in. So it tends to correct it in a lot of cases, right? Neck extensions can also have benefits because you're straightening out the neck and you're building it properly. But a lot of guys, when they do neck extensions, they're, they're, they're doing this, you know? So they're only making the pattern worse. You know, they're getting more tight in the neck, more tonic. So I would say this, um, train the front and the back. And if you start getting a lot of pain from it, then you see your posture is getting worse. Maybe drop the extensions or lower the weight a little bit and focus more on those curls. I think the curls is the main feature of staying uh, in good posture. What's your favorite video game of all time? Okay, without a doubt, I would have to say it's Tales of Symphonia. Man, that's a masterpiece of a game. A pure, pure masterpiece. Extremely long, over 50 hours to complete the main story, okay? Lots of side quests, lots of content, extreme character development. It's, it's just so incredible. I cannot describe how amazing it is. Tales of Symphonia. In fact, on the GameCube edition, the game was so large that they had to put it into two discs. It's a very long game. It's extremely long, detailed. I love it. I love old school games in general because that's what I grew up with. You know, and it's not too old school. I'm sure a lot of you guys have played it, but um, it's my favorite game of all time for sure. And then the next would have to be uh, in the Zelda series. I like all the 3D Zeldas. I liked every single one of them. Uh, Ocarina of Time, Fantastic, Majora's Mask, uh, Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, all amazing games. I even enjoyed Skyward Sword. A lot of guys didn't like Skyward Sword, but I thought it was incredible, personally. You know, I really, really enjoyed it. But yeah, Tales of Symphonia, that's my number one, for sure. That said, though, what's your favorite game of all time? I'd be curious in hearing your feedback. Let me know. And with that said, folks, hope you enjoyed this Q&A, and I'll talk to you all next time.